Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, we are really lopsided today. Nathan, don't look. <laughs> I'll sit on this side. <laughs> the, the ship will not fall over, we promise. So in thinking about thinking about what to share this morning, um, after Wednesday's message, after the themes that have come from the House of Prayer, <coughs> after what's been coming up in worship, um, the Lord wants to talk to us about our hunger. Are we hungry? And, you know, I was thinking that if you've ever had a meal and been truly satisfied, like not too much, not, not a little bit hungry, but just right, and you've mm -hmm. been truly satisfied, when he says, come and taste, it's to be satisfied. And sometimes in our lives, the only time we hunger is when we have a great need, right? But how do you stay hungry when you have, you know, without going without food for three weeks? How do you stay hungry without the fasting and the, you know, how do you stay hungry when things are actually going really well? How do you stay hungry when, you know, things are going well and, and it, what is it? What is it that we want from God? Do we want just things to be okay in our lives? Or we want to see him manifest in such a way. Do we want, do we really believe the end of the book and how things are supposed to end in this earth? And what is it that we hunger for? I mean, that's just, I, I, those are the things that were going through my mind. And um, Google's a wonderful thing. I don't have to get my <laughs> thousand page Strong's Concordance out anymore. You can just Google a scripture, a scripture about hunger. And there was a whole bunch of like, nope, 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 nope. And then I came across Isaiah 55. And I think this is exactly what the Lord wants to say this morning. And the Message Bible, of course, is just a different way of saying the scriptures that we all already know. So, hey there, all who are thirsty, come to the water. Are you penniless? Come anyway, buy and eat. Come buy your drinks, buy wine and milk. Buy without money, everything's free. Why do you spend your money on junk food, your hard-earned cash on cotton candy? Listen to me, listen well, eat only the best, fill yourself only with the finest. And if that's not exactly what Nathan just preached on Wednesday, uh -huh. I encourage you to get the seed. Don't eat the blooming onion when there's the steak coming. <laughs> Don't yeah. fill up on the blooming onion when the steak's coming. Yeah. Pay attention, come close now, listen carefully to my life-giving, life-nourishing words. I'm making a lasting covenant with you. The same that I made with David, <clears throat> sure, solid, enduring love. I set him up as a witness to the nations, made him a prince and leader of the nations, and now I'm doing it to you. You'll summon nations you've never heard of, and nations who've never heard of you will come running to you because of me, your God, because the Holy One of Israel has honored, and I will say has chosen, has handpicked you. Seek God while he's here to be found. Pray to him while he's close at hand. Let the wicked abandon their way of life and the evil their way of thinking. Let them come back to God who is merciful. Come back to our God who is lavish with forgiveness. I don't think the way you think. The way you work isn't the way that I work, God decrees. For as the sky soars high above the earth, so the way I work surpasses the way that you work. And the way I think is beyond the way that you think. So stop thinking and stop working. Amen. Amen. Just as the rain and snow descend from the skies and don't go back until they've watered the earth, doing their work of making things grow and blossom, producing seed for the farmers and food for the hungry, so will the words that come out of my mouth not come back empty-handed. They'll do the work I sent them to do. They'll complete the assignment I gave them to give. So you'll go out in joy. You'll be led into a whole and complete life. The mountains and the hills will lead the parade, bursting with song. All the trees of the forest will join the, pro the, join the procession, exuberant with applause. No more thistles, but giant sequoias. No more thorn bushes, but stately pines. Monuments to me, to God, living and lasting evidence of God. The Lord wants to encourage us this morning that he will feed. If you even think you're hungry, just ask. Exactly. Yeah. Ask, and he is there to give us whatever it is we hunger and we thirst for. Sometimes, you know, I, I find myself praying about the situation.
situation, but I forget to ask. I forget to just ask. You know, we, we think that sometimes our little things are too much, but you know what? If we start to learn what that feeling of satisfaction is, to learn, that's how he proves his faithfulness to us is in the small things. So when the big things come, we don't question it. That's right. But are you truly satisfied? Or do you really think that there is more? I believe there's more. I believe we haven't even seen the beginning of the, of the end. Yeah. We're at the, the, the beginning of the end. I think Nathan talked about that a long time ago. But it's the church. What, what does Israel have to be jealous of? What is Israel? It's our job to walk and live in such a way that Israel goes, they've usurped our God. They have usurped the blessings of our God. I'm ready to do some usurping. And I'm ready to walk in that blessing that he has promised. That's what God wants. You think that we want it. He wants to come. He wants the new Jerusalem. He wants the new heaven and the new earth. He wants to, no more tears. No more tears, no more kisses. So I just encourage you all, hunger and thirst. Ask God. Dig up those old hopes, those old, those old hopes that, well, you know, I don't know about you guys, when I was a new believer, I had a big dreams, big dreams. I, I, there was, it didn't occur to me that God couldn't do big things. But over the years, those big things didn't come to pass quite yet, as I thought they might. Over the years, stopped maybe asking for believing for those big things. So I just encourage you, what has God placed in your heart that's your hope that he wants to give you? And don't, don't give up. Yeah. Be satisfied. Taste and see. Yeah. <laughs> son also has, um, I'm trying to remember exactly what it is, but something to do with lung capacity where he's only, he's eight years old and only able to breathe like 60 some percent of capacity of his lungs. Then have another friend that I also work with that um, just had a lot going on with her life. Her, her dad, he was, you know, for everything there, died 22 years ago. So, you know, she's reflecting back upon that, but her son, who's also in his early 20s, he just, he went back into drugs and that's really and then lastly, um, one of the dogs she's fostering had puppies, and the dog accidentally bit one of the puppies in the in the skull. And the pup's not doing so well. So on top of everything else, you know that that's happening. So just that's your friend. Sheila. Um, yeah, Mary Kay Fitzgerald. Um,
remind you again, and thank you again for at least, you know, asking him that so she can feel at peace and content that she can have a relationship with the Lord. So pray for Mary and her family and give them all the air and keep it safe. So. You know, I don't know what happened. I had an intersection. I had to be over to Austin one day. There's nowhere for them to grow root. We cast them out. We hold our peace. We just trust. And we reach out to each other. That's why we come together. Yes. To say, stand with me. Yes. You know, help me. If when, when I'm not feeling my best. It's the purpose of this body. And I'm 
cancer was in the chest at one time. And ever since that happened, I don't think she is in the, in the right place spiritually speaking. She has developed a lot of mistrust and uh, but she feels like she's not worthy of God. So I'm talking to her a few days ago and I sent her something that I wrote recently. And then she was telling me that she really likes it. And she said, I wish I could be touched by God the same way that you are. But I don't know why it doesn't happen. I love the word. I love the message. I love the worship. I just don't trust in the preacher. So the church that she goes to sometimes, the only church that her boyfriend and, her mom and his mom go on occasion, there's a lot of religiosity and legalism in that church. So I told her, why don't you start reading the word on your own and ask the spirit to reveal to you what God wants you to understand. So I would like if we can lift her up so that she gets that revelation that she needs so that she can get to that place where she can know and taste and see. Amen. Anxious when you're worried, guard your appetite. God, don't let anything ruin your appetite. Anybody else? Well, I want to, yeah. Um, thankful this morning. Uh, Bonnie, as always, is awesome. And uh, just the things that take place in secret and private, but then the result of some of those things. 
things when you know when any one of us get to see the result of that openly, you know it's God. And um, Laura's uh, brother and uh, his family uh, came up this weekend, but um, uh, Laura's going to a job interview on Monday. That's enormous, more huge than anyone in here maybe can understand, but to know what she's been dealing with for the last, I don't know how long, but um, it's just a result of the body of Christ responding and uh, doing what they know they feel as God is, is uh, revealing to them. And I'm just tears of joy thankful because it's awesome. I mean, it's just completely awesome because, you know, just the things that are being talked about this morning, I, I was reading in John 16, um, Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he's speaking to them in parables about him going back to the Father and they're clueless. It's like they start talking to themselves, what's, what's he talking about? I, we don't get it. And then later down the chapter, he, Jesus says he's, you know, I'm going to speak clearly and plainly to you. And then they respond, he says um, in, uh, I think, 32, uh, no, let me back up. I came out of the Father and have come into the world. Again, I'm leaving the world and going to the Father. And his disciples, disciples said, ah, oh, now we get it. Now you're not speaking in parables, you're speaking plainly to me. God is speaking very plainly today, yeah. as he does every day. He says, now we know that you are acquainted with everything and have no need to be asked questions. Because of this, we believe that you really came from God. Jesus answered them and said, do you now believe? So you really do now believe. It doesn't matter when you believe. It matters that you do believe. Yeah. And in that belief comes many things. And I love how it finishes. I have told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace yes. and confidence yes. in the world you have crap, you have tribulation, you have distress, you have all the nonsense that goes on, but, but forget about it. As hard as it is to in the flesh to forget about it, he has. It's done, it's over with, and the battle is, you know, we've talked about this a gajillion times, but the battle is within ourselves. It isn't whether or not Jesus actually did it or not, because he did. And in those things, James, I proclaim you are healed in the name of Jesus. Yes. Yes. There is no fear. You have to have no doubt. Your hearing will be restored and you will play the drums better than you have ever played in your entire life. Yes. Um, all these things that, you know, that, that we see, that we feel come up, because I do too. I mean, I think we all do. It's like, oh, uh, how am I going to do this? But then realize that Jesus is stronger and has overcome everything yeah. in this life that we could ever even think, imagine, or go through. Right, right. In Jesus' name. I just Amen. thank you. I praise him for it. Yeah. 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 Well, um, if, if, if anybody who wants hunger, anything who wants, everybody who wants encouragement, who wants us to agree together, let's just come and pray together. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. God. Thank you. Anyone who has a need this morning and believes that perfect love casts out all fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you leave us rest with you, Lord, that your love never fails. That you never rest, Lord, you never forsake us, Lord. That you are a chosen remnant of your people, Lord, and we admit that you want us to have peace with the world. Thank you.
have a purpose and a plan for every person in this body. And we trust that you will fulfill the work that the word has sent into our hearts to do. Oh, Lord Jesus, we trust in you. And we rejoice that you have made a way, Lord, where we can't see it. But we trust in you, Lord. Lord's been burning my heart since early this morning, and I even heard it from an archive of a place that won in a major revival, and the Lord was speaking to me, this place right now, this day, can be a marker in history if we let it. Do we choose to have this day, July 20th, 2014? day that is marked in history that God moved in this place. He works through all of us. No matter how young, no matter how old. Just open up the Lord and let the Lord release his kingdom through you. I don't know if you've been filled with the Holy Spirit or not, but we're going into a time of worship. If you've never received the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I encourage you to press in this morning. And those of you who have received the gift, that have had the gift in years gone by, and you felt that the fire has gone down to a coal, I challenge you now, let the wind of the Lord blow on it. Even if you were a little child and you were on fire for God and something through the years has caused you to step back, I challenge you, let's enter in. We need to, the time is short. There are souls that need to be saved. There are family members that need to be saved. There are those that need to be reclaimed for the kingdom. This morning is the time to set the marker. Are we hungry? Yes. Are we hungry? Yes. Oh, Jesus. Let's proclaim the word.
Ed was not here at the moment. <laughs> you, in the yellow shirt, please. <laughs> it is. I'm, yeah, I think it's recirculating right now. Peter, can you please pray for the offering? Father, Jesus. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. 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 Susan's in the house. Hallelujah. Let's worship the Lord.
changing around here. We're just celebrating the presence of the Lord. All right. Come on now. Peter and I gave up our uh, drab uh, green choir robes with the white white bib thing. <laughs> Still better than light blue. Yeah. We retired them because of the coffee and donut stains. Yeah. Hallelujah. He just wants us to come unto him like little children. So if we got on some stuff, he just wanted to celebrate, and we want to celebrate the love he has for us. He's did it all. We just got to celebrate with him. There's a banqueting table. There's not a long line waiting outside for something on a stick, okay?
choose to be followers of you, Lord, branded, sealed by your Holy Spirit, Lord. Worship the Spirit of Draw near to him. 
waiting for you.
as always. Praise God. Appreciate your Amen. being sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Amen. And thank all of you for being here on both sides of the aisle. God is good. Praise the Lord. And somewhere in Hawaii, there are people looking for their clothes this morning. It's okay. Praise the Lord. What? Yes, yes, yes. Just storm the stage. Praise the Lord.
You know, uh, just to carry on the thought uh, Darlene was talking about, and also what has been testified to here this morning. You know, over the last few days, I was watching some programming on Christian TV, and, and uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not being critical, other than just to say that, you know, we have such an Old Testament mentality when it comes to God. And, uh, you know, the, we believe the entire Bible, but we understand the context in which the Old Testament is preached. It's pointing us to Jesus. It's all about God's grace and God's love for us. And the law was to bring us to the end of ourselves. And uh, sadly, uh, some of us never got there. I mean, a lot of people still dealing with themselves self-focused, they're self-centered, they're self-conscious, and that's what we're supposed to be set free from. You know, I mean, I don't know, I don't want to be uh, disrespectful or anything, but, you know, people smoke pot, uh, get drunk, get high, and one of the main reasons for doing that, I'm talking about, uh, I'm talking about abuse is to get out of themselves to get free of you know all this stuff that bugs us you know that just irritates us and that's what Jesus gave us yeah. I'm not saying you know you can't have a beer you can't I'm, I, that's not my point the, the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that a lot of the artificial things that people do are to bring them into a place that God wants us to have naturally, which is where we're not just totally absorbed with ourselves, our weaknesses, our failures, our angers, our frustrations, and all of that kind of stuff. Praise the Lord. You know, the first Adam, and I think everybody agrees with this, pardon me for doing this, but I don't know if anybody ever had a mustache, I've got one of these hairs that just will not do what it's supposed to do, and I can see it out of the corner of my eyes, driving me nuts. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, the first Adam, he, because of his sin, because of his disobedience, made everybody after him a sinner. I'm, you all know that, right? I mean, I've talked about this before, but let's just go back over some ground here briefly. All you had to do to be a sinner was to get born. People are not sinners because of what they do. They're sinners because of who they are. Their offspring of Adam. Now, I'm not saying they don't do bad stuff. I'm just saying that isn't what that isn't how God identifies them as being sinners. They're just doing what a sinner would do. If you're born in Adam, you're just being Adamic. So it shouldn't surprise us. But no matter what a person does in that condition or in that position as a child or offspring of Adam, will not make you righteous. You'll remain a sinner no matter how many good things you do as Adam's seed. I mean, you can give all your money away. You can volunteer at the food center, the, the, the shelters, the, the hospitals. You can help old ladies across the street. You can do whatever you want to do all of your life, pour all of your energies and your effort into doing good stuff, and you will still be a sinner in God's eyes. Now, along comes a second Adam. That's Jesus. And so he makes us righteous the same way we were made sinners, by being born again. Yes. You get born again, and now all of a sudden you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Not because of anything you did, but simply because of a rebirth. Yes. The new birth. Now you are a seed of God, a child of God. Amen. Amen. You've been delivered from the curse, which is the law, the, the demands, by being born again. And likewise, your bad behavior cannot change your righteous position. Everybody swallow real hard and then just get this. I'm not encouraging you to be bad. 
I'm just saying bad behavior will no more change your position in Christ than your good behavior could change your position in Adam. That's what the Bible teaches us. So when we have preachers and evangelists and ministers and other disbelievers constantly going around telling you you got to do a bunch of stuff in order to be accepted by God, they're not telling you the truth. That's not Bible. I'm sorry. I'm not sorry, but I'm sorry for anybody that believes that. Likewise, the callings and elections, the giftings of God are without repentance. If you are, under the Old Testament, under the mindset of many of these preachers, of, from, the, from the point of view that they're preaching, only certain people have anointings, or only certain people can function in power, in the supernatural. That's Old Testament. Right. Because the Holy Spirit only moved upon certain people, the prophets and the and the priests, kings. The average guy was just stuck with their situation. And that's basically what many, many Christian ministers are still expounding. But Jesus said, these signs follow them that believe. The same signs follow you that follow me or, or any big name evangelist or preacher or prophet or whatever you want to call them. Now, that's the, that's the truth. You don't have to go to somebody and have them lay hands on you. Have your husband lay hands on you if he's a believer. Lay hands on yourself. Have your child lay hands on you. I mean, if you just don't have the faith to just believe it, get, just get another believer. They've got the power. They've got the anointing. The problem is they don't think God will use them because they've been told over and over and over God only uses those that really work, work, work for Jesus. And that is a lie. And it's a deception. And more than that, it's insidious because it's gotten throughout the body of Christ and it's made us weak and anemic and dysfunctional. I'm not denying the motivation behind that preaching. I'm denying the reality and the truth of it. You can be well motivated and still be totally wrong. Everything we've been about in this church is to, is to activate you, not me. You don't need to come to me and have me lay hands on you. I don't mind doing it. That's not the point. I don't do it for the very reason that I want you to do it. Because I don't want to perpetuate this idea that somehow I have some great anointing when there's only one anointing to begin with. Hallelujah. It's Amen. Jesus. If you have Jesus, you've got the anointing. I understand we sometimes, you know, maybe our faith is weak, and so we need a brother or a sister. That's why we come together, you know. I mean, that's the reason for coming together. We all have ups and downs, but our power doesn't diminish with our moods. My feelings change, but who I am stays the same all the time. I'm, I am the righteousness of God in Christ, whether I feel like it or not. I am righteous. I am holy because he's declared me that. I don't always feel that way. I don't always look that way. <laughs> Thank you, Tammy. <laughs> you only said what everybody else wanted to say. That's because this is a, this is a daughter, and she knows. Praise the Lord. She's right close there, you know, I mean, she sees it all. But I was just thinking, you know, we passed around, it, and many of you have seen this, and if you haven't, I hope you'll, you'll get it. Um, the Father of Lights. In fact, it was Darlene's daughter that shared it with us when we were uh, out in Colorado last spring, this past spring. And uh, we were watching, well, we watched several different videos of um, the, the same type by the same uh, producer, in fact. And this is the latest one. And it's, you need to see it if you have Because it bears out what I'm talking about. I, I get excited. You've heard, already heard me getting a little loud here this morning already. But that's not necessary. Right. It's not necessary. It's just you get excited. Hallelujah. So you just get excited, you know. And that's okay. But you don't have to be that way uh -huh. in order for God to use you. Right. If you watch that video, you'll see some of the most dynamic yeah. miracles that have been uh, recorded in, in recent memory. 
you know, in, in, in our day, in, in contemporary times, by a guy who just kind of yeah. goes along and says, you know, the devil doesn't have dominion here, and I'm not going to allow him to stay here. And another young guy who looks like something out of uh, the illustrated man. <laughs> everywhere and the whole thing and he actually gets a Muslim to get them into the Dome of the Rock yeah. as Chris, knowing that they're Christians because he prayed for the guy and healed him of a bad back or a bum yeah. leg. I can't remember now exactly yeah. what it was. And he wasn't shouting and screaming and no. I don't know. he was just talking to the guy and he said, how are you feeling better? Here, let me pray with you. And the guy gets healed because this is a child of God. That's exactly right. We're all children of God, but a lot of us just don't have that identity really settled. Because we're still thinking, if I could just be better, you know, if I could just not do that again, or if I could just pray longer, or fast more, or be more like so-and-so or somebody else, you are like Jesus in the eyes of God. How, who are you going to try to emulate? He's already declared you to be an heir and a joint heir with Christ. So I, I appreciate everybody's effort in, in wanting to see revival. But I, I don't want to see what we've had in the past because it's not the revival that God wants us to have. That's Old Testament kind of stuff. God wants one where his glory fills the earth. Not, it doesn't just occupy a place. But it's filled everywhere you are, it is. Amen. And as Darlene said, the way that happens is we just start sharing the love of God and the grace of God with anybody and everybody that God puts in our path. That's our sphere of influence. Whoever they are, wherever they are. Don't give them more rules. We don't demand, I mean, come on, who are we to demand anything? He didn't demand anything of us. Other than to believe. Amen. Okay? We're going to take up another offering now because I'm going to then start my regular <laughs> message. You praise the Lord. Just kidding. <laughs> for those of you who are looking for your car keys, I'm just joking. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Let's go, let's do that. Let's go to Psalms uh, chapter 16 and verse 11. And I want to talk about this a little bit further, but in a little bit different way. But this is not, see, I, I mean, the whole point is, this is not about us. Not the us that we think of. It's about the, the Jesus in us. The life that we live in him. About the born again person, the spirit man. Right? Who we really are in Christ. This is what it always has been. Well, maybe not quite. It's <laughs> sagging a little here and there. And gravity's having its effect. But, I mean, inside, I'm this new creature. This just goes the way of the flesh. I mean, we can do everything we can to try to maintain it, but eventually, it's going the way of all flesh, hallelujah, unless the Lord comes back first. But who I am inside is renewed every day. Never ages. Never will age. Praise the Lord. And it's true of you, too. And that's who we have to be identifying with here. Because just like our behavior, our physiology changes. I look in the mirror and I think, or, you know, I don't so much in the mirror, but just, you know, you're going around and somebody takes a picture or you see yourself in a car window and you go, who is that old man? <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just not who I think of yeah. as being me. Praise the Lord. So I don't spend a lot of time in front of the mirror, as you can well see. But, but who I am inside, who you are inside, that's the identity that God wants us to understand and to relate to. Amen? Because it, it isn't affected by the flesh. It isn't affected by our feelings, our moment-by-moment -moment circumstances and situations, because God knows they go up and down, and they are horrible. As my brother loves to say, all humans are dysfunctional. Every family is dysfunctional. And, you know, he was a cop. He ought to know. 
I'm just saying, if you're human, there's dysfunction there. I mean, that's just part of it. And But who we are inside, see, it's perfect. And if we, let, if we allowed ourselves to live out of that reality, the dysfunction is minimal. It's still there because we still got flesh. But we have a greater impact in a positive way by living out of who we are in Christ. By, by being positive about that. That's not egotistical. That's, that's being realistic. That's being God-like. Amen? So he says, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. And what I want you to see in this, because we're going to talk about this path that we're on, this journey, is that the path that we're all looking for, the path, I'm trying to find my path, you're trying to find your path, you're trying to find, and there's only one path. Right. And it's his path. It says, you will show me the path of life in thy presence. He's telling you where the path is. In his presence there's fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. It's like the become cliche, but you know the story of the guy walking on the beach, and you know, he's going through really tough times, and he, and God said, I'll always be with you, and he's looking, and he says, yeah, but where were you, you know, when this was happening? I only see one set of footprints, and God says, I was carrying you. Right. We're, in, we're on the path, right. but it's not our path, it's his path. Right. We are in Christ. Yes. We are new creatures, right? right? So that's what he's trying to get us to, to understand here, and then in, in the if you go on down to verse 17, you can go there if you want, Sheila, you don't have to. It's uh, Psalm 17, verse 4. He says, concerning, listen to this now, concerning the works of men. Now, that's what we heard about here this morning. Right. Donnie, this is not a reflection on you guys because we all have it. You know, you just had the courage enough to say you're having an issue, you know, pray with you. That's why we come together. Is that very Amen. Right? Amen. Likewise, James, you know, he's yeah. struggling with some fears and anxieties and stuff. Okay, that's understandable. But here's what God is saying about this. Concerning the worst of men, our fears, our failures, our works, our good works, our bad works, our you know, negatives, our, our positives. By the word of thy lips, I have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. Now, there's many paths of the destroyer, but there's only one path for the believer. And it's by the word of his lips yeah. that I stay on the right path. Yeah. When I start confessing yeah. my situation and my circumstances, instead of declaring what God has said, I find myself on a path with a load of work and guilt and shame and fear that were never mine to begin with. They weren't, I'm not supposed to be having that. But I've stepped off the path and started on my own path, man's path. As long as I stay in agreement with God, the crooked places are made straight. Yes. The high places are brought low, and the low places are brought high, so that it's a smooth plane. Yes. That's God's purpose. That's God's intent for all of us, okay? All right, now, let's go to Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18. Hallelujah got a lot of scriptures this morning because I don't want you to get my opinion. I want you to know what the word of God says. But the path of the just. Amen. How many of you know we are justified? Amen. That'd be us, the just. The path of the just is the shining light that shineth more and more under the perfect day. Praise the Lord. The longer you stay on the path, I was talking about this a week or so ago. Disciples is what God's after. He's not looking for converts. Amen. He's after disciples. Yep. And a disciple is a lifelong thing. Mm -hmm. yep. It's a journey. Yep. And you're, you're either gaining revelation and growing or you become stagnant. God wants us on the path of the just. One that revelation is shining on us. Yeah. We're getting light. We're getting revelation all the time. I'm not saying every second of the day. That's the nature of spirit beings, yes. right? Amen. It shines more and more under the perfect day. So the more revelation I have, the more I shine. The more I can reflect God's truth. The more I can impact other people with the light. That are, I mean, there's darkness. But wherever we go, it becomes light. But only if we understand we are the light. Yes. We, we're the body of Christ. We've become the light of the world. 
We are the revelation this world needs. So let's quit rehashing stuff that is no not revelation at all. It's simply tradition. And many times, false to begin with. Misunderstood, misrepresented. Regardless of the motives or, or the well-meaning behind it. Right? All right? Proverbs chapter 3 then, and verses 5 and 6. And then we'll get going. Thank the Lord. But I want you to understand this path. Trust in the Lord. This goes back to saying what God says, right? What we talked about in, in Psalm. So trust in the Lord with all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding, because your own understanding will mess you up. Because your own understanding is dealing with logic. And it's only natural that you would be fearful about an upcoming thing that you don't have personal control over. Right. Or it's only natural that you would be uh, you know, uptight over a, you know, a medical procedure that you're not familiar with, and it's invasive, and it's not fun for anybody, and you know they could have bad results and negative stuff, you know why they do them. And so, I mean, yeah, I'm just saying, I get that. But you've got to trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your understanding about these things. In all thy ways, acknowledge him. Yeah. Yeah. He's the provider. He's the healer. He's the deliverer. He's the savior. He's the righteousness that makes us righteous. And he shall direct thy path. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Verse 6, in all thy ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. How? Because it's his path. And you're on it with him. Praise the Lord. Amen. Now when he says paths here, he's not talking we got about a bunch of paths. He's talking about people, plural, people, paths. Right. Still just one path. Amen? Amen? So when a person is, is born again and trusts in the grace of God, because that's the only way you can get born again, for by grace are ye saved, not by works, lest any man should boast. Amen? When that happens, it doesn't mean, and these scriptures are telling us, and, and Paul validates all of this throughout the New Testament with his teachings, even though he's the teacher of grace, even when we're born again and understand that it's by grace, that doesn't mean the temptation to trust in good works disappears. And you say, so what? Big deal. I'll tell you why. Because the moment you start trusting in good works, you're off the path. He sets you on a plain path. The moment you believe, he puts you on a grace path. Amen. But it doesn't mean that you won't be tempted to do a bunch of good stuff to get more favor with God. And that's my problem with preachers that inject this stuff, even though they'll fling the word grace out there every once in a while. Then they try to reel you back in with something that you haven't done or should do. Well, it's a temptation to fall back under works. Well, what could be wrong with that? It gets you off the path. Right. It's no longer God's path you're on now. It's your path. Right. Right. No matter what point in your journey, let's call it, in your discipleship, if you will, the path that you're on can become a performance path path where you earn your acceptance, where you get your favor from God by what you're doing. And I can tell you from my own experience, it's always a tempting detour. Not because I sit around and think about it. It just is human nature, fallen man's nature, the flesh, to want to have some part, take some credit for get a pat on the back, get some acknowledgement, get someone's approval, get people to think you're better because of something you do. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. I know we're all familiar with it, but we'll read it again here just because it's worth reading. Praise the Lord. Amen. O foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that ye should not obey the truth? before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you, receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? So Paul's talking to people that were born again, by grace, 
heard the grace message, because he's the one that started this church in Galatia, only to have them be tempted to get back into works. He, what he's saying in another way is simply, you're on the wrong path. You were on the right path. Who pointed you in the wrong direction and got you off the path? Amen? See, it's a path that it requires you to veer away from God's path. It's a path that looks right. It sounds holy. It's a path that looks like something God would have created. But it isn't. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's the path. That's God's path. Now, the good stuff is fine. It all looks good. But if you're doing it to enhance your relationship with God, or if you're doing it to get more power or greater anointing, it's not God's path anymore. It's now your path. It's a works path. It's a performance path. Amen. Praise the Lord. God created only one path. One path to him, one path with him. Yes. Just one. Yes. And at no point in your journey does God's path evolve into a personal path. I'll say it again. Nowhere in your journey does God's path evolve into a personal path, your path. Right. It's his path, right. the life that I now live. Yeah, it's not I to live, but it's Christ that liveth in me. The works that I do, Jesus said, it's not me that doeth it, it's the Father that's in me. He does the works. The minute it becomes about me and my anointing or my special relationship with God, it's more hype than it is God. There's, there's just one path. And the, the more we focus on us, the further from that path we get. We didn't get on the path because of what we were doing. We got on the path because of what Jesus had already done. And to then focus on anything other than the finished work of the cross takes us off the path and back on our own. When, when we trust in man, we're only going to get what man can produce. That's right. And that's what God was talking about when he said, I'm trusting horses, I'm trusting chariots. David said, but I will trust in the Lord. Because somebody might have a bigger horse, a faster horse. You know, sturdier chariot. But nobody's going to be able to compete with God. The performance path is ultimately a performance trap. It's a snare. It's what the devil uses to minimize the body of Christ's ability to truly, honestly represent God. Whether it's healing, whether it's deliverance, whether it's prosperity, regardless of what it is. The moment we get involved in, the moment our performance connects with this, it moves the focus away from God and onto somebody or a group of somebody's. Amen? Amen? Hebrews 13 and 8. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? God never changes lanes. No. Praise the Lord. It's never about your religion. It's always the same grace path. That's the lane you were in when God saved you. That's the lane God stays in. He's not cutting in or cutting out. He's, he's, he gets on one path. That's the path. The path that got you in was grace. The path that keeps you in is grace. The path that keeps you on the path, on your journey, is grace. 
to deviate from that, all of a sudden it's not God anymore, it's you again. Jesus, the second Adam, is greater. We're, what we're saying when we do these things is that the first Adam had more power than Jesus. Come on. Because if, if all the things that we did in Adam, all of the good things that we did in Adam didn't separate us from Adam, didn't make us better, still kept us as a sinner or an offspring of Adam, everybody say, yeah, yeah, amen, amen. And yet we say that then Jesus comes along and puts us in righteous standing with God, that now his work is less effective because if I do something wrong, it can take me out of that position. That's what we're saying. That's what we're preaching when we tell people those things. We're, we're, we're talking, oh, the blood, oh, Jesus, praise the Lord. And then we turn around and say, but his blood is less efficacious, if you will, than Adam. We're saying Jesus is weak, Jesus is less, Jesus is less than a man. Praise the Lord. Now, if there was a way to irritate God, I think that would probably be it. <laughs> we're, we're saying we, as human beings, have more power than God in the flesh in terms of, of, of sin or, or, or righteousness? You know, that's what I'm saying. We need to get these things so settled in us so that when we hear this mixed message, this, this yeah, it's by grace you're saved, but, but nothing. There's no buts about this. You're saved by grace. That's it. I'm not saying there aren't consequences for bad behavior after you're saved by grace. Right. Poor choices, you get poor results. <laughs> but it doesn't have any, any whatsoever impact on your righteous standing with God. Right. Right. It affects your here and now. Mm. Your being able to receive and, 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 and enjoy all of the benefits that God has for you. Why? Because you end up thinking... This, this idea of my behavior still is affecting my relationship. Therefore, if I haven't been perfect, I have no right to expect that God's going to heal me. I can't expect that God's going to open any financial doors for me. I can't expect that God's going to give me any kind of success. I don't deserve it. Of course you don't deserve it. Any more than you deserve to go to hell just because you got born. Come on. I know this is not a religious message. It's not popular with our religious way of thinking, but bless God, it's the truth anyway. This is, what, this is how this good news is about. It's not good news if I'm still involved in the process. I can tell you that right now. It's not that good. It might be better than what it was, but it's still a long ways from good because I can influence it too much. The good news is he finished it for you. Yeah. He did everything he could do, and now we spend all of eternity rejoicing in that work of Christ. Yes. The path that he put me on. Yes. Praise the Lord. It's never about your religion. It's always about this same grace path. I don't care what the motive is. It can be ego. It can be pride. It can be just flat out ignorance. But you can't allow it to move you off of that path. Right. Now, in Romans chapter 11, verses 5 and 6. <clears throat> I'm going to move along here so we can get out here. Even so, then, at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So what he's saying, uh, to capsulize this, is simply, it's either grace or it's works. Right. You can't have grace and a little bit of work. Right. Any more than you can have work and grace. Right. It's one or the other. Which is why the whole type and shadow under the Old Testament of mixture was bad. Yeah. 
You don't mix wool with linen. You don't mix, you know. Why? Because he was trying to show us something, a greater truth, which is you can't mix the law with grace. You can't mix the old covenant with the new covenant. Unless you understand that the old covenant was all just man's working to try to achieve what man could never achieve. And then Jesus finishing that work. So that everything under that old covenant points to the finished work of Christ. Including this idea of certain people with certain anointings or greater anointings. Or, hey, I don't know what it is. I just know that there's only one anointing. And it's the same for everybody. Everybody lays hands on the sick and they recover. If they believe that. Everybody casts out demons. Everybody lays hands on the sick yes. and sees them recover. Amen. I'm not trying to belittle ministry. I'm trying to build up the body of Christ. I'm Amen. not interested in any more of that stuff. I'm just not interested in it. All it does is demean the entire body. Yes. Whether it's intentional or not is not my point. I, I can't read people's minds and I don't really care what the motive is. I just know what the result is. The result is we end up sitting on pews looking for some new prophet or priest to come along to answer all my problems, and I've got the answer. I've told most of this church, I, I went down this path, man. I mean, I went to Tucson. I went to Minneapolis, to Rodney Howard Brown. I went everywhere to get everybody to lay hands on me to get me what God told me in a motel room in Minneapolis. I already had. And it's no different for you. I went down that path. I've been on that journey. I went to get this and that and to have this one lay hands and this one to anoint me and that one to push me down or have me pass out or whatever. And I'm not trying to minimize the fact that those things can happen. But what God told me clearly, distinctly, in a motel room while I was griping and complaining that the guy wouldn't pray for me, he prayed for everybody around me but me. And I'm moving my head around like I'm just, just trying to get a... You know, a quickie here. I'll, I'll sneak in under his hand when he's not expecting it, you know. And it'll be too late for him to take the <laughs> anointing back. And I'm, not, I'm saying this for only one thing. This is what happened. This is a God's honest truth. The first night, I didn't sit where the, where the preachers sat. They have sections for the, for the preachers because, of course, we're special. <laughs> well, I didn't sit there because I wanted to make sure it was God. Right. Well, he avoided me like the plague. I had, like, you know, Judas or something on my forehead. And he just he went by me. He looked at me. He went right on by me. I thought, oh, my God. This is no good for me, you know. So the next night, and he prayed for every preacher in there. So the next night I thought, well, God, maybe I misunderstood you. <laughs> I mean, after all, I am a preacher. I, it's only right that I be set with the preachers. So the next night I sat with the preachers. He wouldn't pray. He prayed for everybody in the row in front of me. He prayed for the guy sitting right next to me. He looked at me and walked right on by. And it was a whole row. And if I'm not mistaken, they were from the Dominican Republic. I can't remember exactly. They were, they were from a South American country. And the guy sitting to my left that he prayed for was a missionary. And when they called everybody up because they were going to give everybody instructions on how to go out the next day and win people to the Lord, I start, just struck up a conversation with this guy. And he says, yeah, he said, uh, we're just up here on a, on a little trip. I brought some of our uh, leaders. They weren't pastors or anything, but just people in the church. And he said, that all of a sudden next to you, he said, his, uh, his brother has terminal cancer. So I turned to pray for the guy. I was just going to pray for him, and the guy said, uh, me. I, I mean, he was trying to speak to me, and my uh, Spanish is, wasn't in his English, and we were kind of hung up there. So I turned to the guy, and he said, and he has cancer. So I'm not thinking anything other than, you know, just pray for the guy. I mean, I put myself in a position here where I don't have any choice now. Hmm. I laid hands on him, and this is a God's honest truth before God. I'm not trying to pump myself up or anything, but I'm just saying I did, and there were like five or six of them, every one of them went out of their seats onto the floor. I only touched one guy. But I still was upset. Went back to the motel room and said, God, you know, come on, what's up? I, 
this guy, and God spoke to me clearly. It was like three or four o'clock in the morning. Sally will tell you, I called her twice while I was up there. I said, this is a bus. I mean, I made this whole trip up here. I didn't have the money really for the trip, but I thought if it's worth, you know, if God, you know, if I get Rodney Howard's lamp for crying out loud, it'd be worth it. And God said, what has Rodney Howard Brown got that you don't have? And I started thinking, well, a big church, a ministry. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the same Holy Ghost you've got. Come on now. And it's Christ in you that's doing this. It's not you. Exactly. So you don't need some man to pray for you. I'm not against having, you know, praying for you. I'm just saying God's trying to get us to understand we've already got everything that we need. We don't need to run to Timbuktu to get somebody Absolutely. that we think has some special anointing because God's used them. God used them because of grace, not because of something that person was doing. Because if you understood their theology, you'd know it had to be by grace because most of them got it all screwed up. That's what God wants to do. God does not want to give his glory to some guy or some ministry. God wants his glory to be revealed through his entire body yes. so that God gets the glory because I'm just some Joe schmuck with 35 people on the east side of Des Moines that half the people in the world don't even know where it is. Uh, and the other half don't care. Amen. Praise the Lord. And we all can feel that way sometimes. But this God has made us so special yes. that he doesn't want us just flittering it away as if it didn't exist. Come on now. Come on now. <clears throat> Amen. Yes. The hunger we need is not for something we don't have. The plate yes. is set right in front of us. I mean, the, the, the spread is out there. We just need to eat. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Amen. We're waiting on another course and, you know, everything we need is right here. Taste and see. Yes. Eat my flesh. Yes. Drink my blood. Amen. Praise the Lord. I know, you don't have to turn there because we're all pretty familiar with this. So, but in, in Luke chapter uh, 15, it's about the prodigal son. So I'm not going to go through all of it for the sake of time. But we know what happens. The, the younger son, he does what everybody does at some point in their life. He decides he knows more than And so he goes off, gets his inheritance. That tells me this is somebody that gets born again, has their inheritance, but just doesn't realize the value of it. Right. And goes out and just fritters it away and gets nothing in return. He finds himself out there in the world eating their junk right. instead of what God had for him to feed on. Right. And he comes to himself and he says, I'm just going home. Because even the servants at my father's house right. are fed better than this. So I'm not going to go back and expect him to take me back as my son. See, that's what happens to us. We screw up, and then we think, okay, our relationship will never be the same. I'm going to have to settle for a lesser relationship here. Well, I won't have any ministry. I won't be able to pray for the sick and see him healed. I won't be able to restore people's relationship. I won't be able to see financially increase in my life because I've frittered it away. So I'll just go back and I'll just go to church and I'll, I'll serve the Lord. But the Bible says that he come with his speech all prepared. Oh, I'm not worthy to even be called your son. I've, I've been a bad boy. But God rushes to him in this parable. The father rushes grabs him, falls on his neck, and begins to tell him how much he loves him. Amen. Doesn't want to hear the repentance. Repentance has already happened, the fact that he's changed his mind about where he's been. It isn't about the laying out and whining and you know, confessing and going through all that stuff. He changed his mind, went back, and God immediately embraces him as his own. As far as he's concerned, he was distant in geography, but not in his heart. Nothing had changed as far as the Father. He puts the robe of righteousness back on him, the sandals, the ring, which represented his authority. The authority of the Father. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. 
But the, uh, the irony of it is, now he, this was all unrighteous behavior. Didn't make him any less the son. But his behavior wasn't right, right? But the irony is that the righteousness of the older brother made him as equally distant from the father as the unrighteousness of the younger brother. So I don't really need somebody that's in as big a mess that I'm in trying to tell me how to fix my mess. I just need God. I just need to know that God loves me and accepts me in my mess. See, Jesus ends this story, and you'll have to go there and read it for yourself. Again, like I said, it's in Luke chapter 15. But he ends the story with the younger brother's relationship with the father restored. And the older brother refuses to join the welcome party and puts that distance between himself and his father. That is a huge message about grace. Religious people don't even know that their righteous behavior is as bad if not worse, right. than our unrighteous behavior. There you go. There you go. It creates a greater distance between them and God than my failures. Right. My unrighteous acts, quote unquote, do not separate me from God. Right. My righteous acts, my self-righteous acts, separate me from God. That's the, that's the story that Jesus is trying to get across here. Right. Praise the Lord. Our, our self-righteous acts can actually be more damaging and unfruitful than acts of unrighteousness. I said it, and I'm not taking it back. Praise the Lord. <laughs> it's the truth. It's the truth. Before you can even get on the right path to God, you've got to acknowledge that God's way is the only way. See, the difference between the right and wrong motive for doing good deeds. Now, I understand what I'm saying here. It's not wrong to do good things. Right. But the difference between the right and the wrong motive for doing good deeds is so that versus because. Mm -hmm. yep. So that versus because. So if you're praying... If you're going to church, if you're fasting, if you're doing, if you're studying the Bible, you're doing all these things so that God will give you, so that God will give you a gold star or use you more dynamically than somebody else. And that's what you hear. That's the difference between my power and your lack thereof is I've dedicated more. I've done more. I've worked harder. I've Prayed fast. I've fasted more. I've suffered. I've, I've given it all to Jesus. And you haven't so much. But I did it so that I would have something you don't have. So that I would have the power. Amen? But when you do the same things because Jesus saved you because he lives inside of you. Then you don't have to worry about falling prey to the performance path. We lay hands on the sick because we're believers. Praise the Lord. Oh, you understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be spiteful and petty. I'm just saying there is crap out there. That is just that. And it's being preached by people that have all, I'm not, that I'm not questioning their, their, their sincerity or their well-meaning motives. I'm just saying it's still wrong and it'll still screw you up. It'll still trap you into a mediocre at best relationship with God. And God wants you to reveal his glory and you cannot do that if you're always looking for somebody else to do it. Somebody with more power, somebody with more anointing, somebody that has a more dedicated, somebody that, you know, doesn't go to work eight hours a day. They stay home and pray and fast all day. There's nothing wrong with that. But it doesn't diminish your authority and your power and your position. Right. 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 
2 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 9 and 10. I don't want to be too, you know, I don't want to be just totally generalizing here, but he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that this is Paul, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I'm strong. Why? Because it's not me. It's him. I depend on him. Yes. Amen. Amen. So you ever wonder why? And again, I'm not. I don't want to just be too much of a, a generalizing here of this, but why some high-level, pious, anointed, powerful people of God seem to all of a sudden just fall into horrible failure? And we could all count them, you know, I mean, we've all got our pets probably, but there's been plenty to go around for everybody. And I'm not ridiculing these people, I'm not criticizing them, I'm saying they're human. I'm just saying, have you ever wondered how that can be? That someone with such power, with such anointing, with such ministry, you see people falling out and being healed and raised, I mean, all, all kinds, I mean, just dynamic, huge followings. And then it's like, bang, out of the clear blue, you're reading some horror story, and how can that happen? Often the cause is because religion. Yes. Even though they may not be old school, quote unquote, Baptist, uh, Pentecostals, you know, holiness kind of stuff. But they've, they've given, they've lived by this idea that it's my dedication, it's my effort, it's my concentrated, uh, you know, relationship with God that's just so focused, it's just <clears throat> that they begin to believe it, and then the truth is, if you're not focused on grace, you're focused on sin. Right. Whether you're actually doing it, eventually you will, because you can't think about something without eventually doing it. That's why we renew our minds and so forth. But that's why the Bible says that the law magnifies sin or multiplies sin because the law focuses on sin. Right. And people who are always finding, finding fault with why you haven't risen or you haven't done it are people that are living under religion. Whether they admit it or not, their own words betray them. See, religious people try to crack the code to God. Right. Always, if I just fast more, or if I just you know, read more or study more or cut myself off or become a monk or go into a cloister somewhere or whatever. I mean, that's the mental kind of thinking that comes from religious people. Right. There's, there's, there's a code. There's a way. I just got to figure it out. I just got to get the right combination of what I got to do. And, and then, bang, it'll just blow up one day. I'll just, whoa, and here I am with all this power and this anointing. And this is how it happened for me, so this is how it's got to happen for you. <laughs> and the truth is, he's a personal God. Amen. And although some of the things that we do upon believing in him may be the same, most of us didn't come to him the same way. Right. We had our own personal things <laughs> that caused us to turn to him. Yeah. Our theology was probably far removed from one another, if we had any at all. Praise the Lord. They try to figure out how they can get God to bless them, how to get God to heal them, how to God to, to prosper them, how to get God to use me. Instead of somebody else, you know. Christianity is not built around performance. It's right. built around Jesus Christ, period. Right. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28.
and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. You know, in this country, I was raised by a businessman. My father had multiple businesses. He had a furniture store, he had a gas station, two gas stations, he had a bulk plant where he hauled fuel uh, to other gas stations that he owned their tanks and their pumps, so they had to buy their fuel from him. So I was raised with work ethic. I was raised that the early bird gets the worm. Work harder, you'll be more successful. Outdo the other guy. Push harder, you know, stay up late, get a plan, get up early, work the plan. So I understand that. But I'm telling you, when we mix business with grace, our focus shifts from God's way to finding ways to prove ourselves through hard work. That's our, that's, as Americans especially, but it's true of humanity in general. Well, he pulled himself up by his bootstraps, you know. He, he's a self-made man. All that's great in the business world. Hard work is good, it's, 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 it's a good thing. But it doesn't work with grace. It works in the business world, but Jesus said, all ye that are laboring and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps and self-made men, come unto me because you're heavy laden. You're burdened down. My burden is light. I'm not telling you to be lazy. I'm not telling you you shouldn't put everything you've got into your job, whether you're self-employed or working for somebody else. That's ethical. That's, that's right. But the problem is we can let that bleed over into our relationship with God and we start thinking that, well, you know, it works in that model. Maybe that model will work in this. But it doesn't. That model does not work in Christianity. It undermines everything that God's trying to do. Success in the business world comes through hard work. But you cannot try to use that model when it comes to the spiritual. Because it's all about Jesus. It's all about a finished work. Praise the Lord. I'm gonna, I'll, I'll, I'll quit with this. In Joshua chapter 3, he, there's this whole, all of this is leading up to the, the exodus. You know, the exodus has gone on, but they've ended up out here in the wilderness. Why? Because even though God delivered them, when they couldn't deliver themselves, through the Red Sea, they still spend the next 40 years trying to figure out things that they can do right. instead of trusting God. Right. And so for 40 years, they're out there. Well, Joshua 3 begins with they're, they're about to get out. But they come to the Jordan, and it's swollen and out of its banks. Uh -huh. Praise the Lord. It's at flood stage. And it's like the, the river's preaching a, 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 you know, a four-word message. You can't do it. You still can't do it. Praise the Lord. So for 40 years, they're out there and never got to the promised land. Hallelujah. Now they're at the Jordan, and there's a physical illustration there that they cannot do this on their own. Right. And then in Joshua chapter 3, verse 17, it says that God told them what to do. The priest takes the ark, which represented the presence of God, and the minute their foot, by faith, they trusted. This, this water was just as deep for everybody. The minute they touched, their foot touched the water, it rolled back. And, and it's amazing, too, because it says that the water rolled all the way back to the city of Adam. Yes. Wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. Religion is poison. I'm telling you, it kills every opportunity for us to experience God. The only thing that impresses God is faith. Faith that He alone is the way to heaven. And to trust Him, to rest in him and his success. You know, I was just thinking yesterday we had a family get together 
and uh, we, the kids had been swimming and doing stuff, and the grandkids, and my daughter, they'd been fixing stuff to eat, and my daughter said, well, come on, Dad, and pray, so we ate. Say grace. And it just dawned on me what grace is. If you're really praying, we always bless the Lord, you know, but then we thank him whatever's going on. Thank you for the family, you know, uh, keeping us and protecting us, watching over us. Thank you for this food. Thank you for providing for us. You see, it's all about him. Grace really is saying, we've trusted you, Lord, and now we're thanking you that you haven't let us down. You've provided. You've protected. You've kept us together. Simple little things that we take for granted. But we're practicing it, and we don't even know it half the time. First right, right. Corinthians 10, 13. verse 13. Praise the name of the Lord. No temptation has come upon you, right? Which is not common to man. Praise the Lord. Okay, never mind. Let it go. Uh, I'll just read you the message translation. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. Amen. Every temptation is to get you off the path. Right. But God is not going to let you if you'll trust him. If you'll put your confidence in him. These temptations are common to man because it's what the devil uses all the time. Has always used. Get you out of faith in God. Get you out of grace into your own effort. Into your own works. Amen. There's only one person. Let me just seal this. Amen. Talk about a landmark here. Only one person can live the Christian life. Only one person can live the Christian life. Everybody say it. Only one person can live the Christian life. And now say, it ain't, me. it ain't me. No, it's Jesus. He's the only one that can do what was necessary to make Christian life a, a reality. Yes. Praise God. Amen. And he'll live it through us. Yes. And he'll live it in us. Yes. Just like getting Israel into the promised land. When we totally abandon to God. Amen? In Deuteronomy 33, 27, it talks about, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Wings, protection. But underneath all of this that we want to describe God are these everlasting arms. Praise God. Amen. So take a leap of faith. Amen? Amen? He's there. He's saying, come on. I'll catch you. Jump. Trust me. Trust my grace. It's, it, it's only scary. James, Donnie, Nathan, all of us. It's only, scary, it's only scary to the extent that we don't know the character of God. That's why we preach this over and over and over. Not to be monotonous, not to just, you know, be rote, but 
It's only to the extent that you understand God's character and his love for you that you can expect from him. Amen. If you're fearful, ultimately, see, fear is sin. Now, thank God for grace. But if you're fearful, what you're saying is, I don't trust you, God. I don't believe you. I'm not trying to condemn you. You know, okay, I, get, I have my issues, too. We, we, we all have anxieties and things, okay? But, but I'm not going to justify them. When we're afraid, we're questioning God's character. We're questioning his provision. We're questioning his grace. Why do we do it? Because we know we don't deserve it. And that's the whole idea of these messages. Is to get us to understand. Not to be egotistical, arrogant, proud. But to understand it's by his grace that we've been saved. And it's by his grace that he does every single thing that he does for us. Every promise in here is based on his grace. Not based on my effort. Not based on my work. Amen. When you know him. When you trust him. It's not scary to leap into his arms because it's just part of the path. Yeah. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So next time you hear, you know, this kind of mixture of grace and law and legalism and what the demands are on you, just turn the channel. Amen. Just don't listen to it. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to belittle anybody, but that's why the, it has, it, faith comes by hearing, and that's a, that's a continuous hearing. So if you're hearing mixed messages, it's hard to establish faith. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways and don't think that he can get anything from God. That's what they're talking about. If I'm thinking sometimes it's what I do and sometimes it's what he did, my mind is double. It's, it's, it's paranoid, it's schizophrenic, and I, there's no way I can trust God to get what God wants to give me. And the only way God will give it to me is if I trust him. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So it's not about trying to put somebody else down or, or pretend like we're something great or better. It's just let's get a single mind, a single vision, stay focused on that, and watch God do what God alone can do. Amen. 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 Make you. He is a good God. That's his character. His character is to be good, to love, and to extend his grace and provision to each and every one of his children, no matter what. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. Stay out of the heat.